Hi and thank you for watching another installment of God's Roadmap to the End. We continue our study today of the Rapture in the third installment of this series. If you have watched the first two videos that I posted in which we covered some aspects associated with the Rapture, you will know that Jesus gave his church the right to exercise his authority over Satan and his worldly kingdom while we await the main harvest event which is known as the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. We have also had a look at an event which is called the First Resurrection and that it, in fact, consists of three parts that can be perfectly understood when we reference the harvest methodology that Israel was instructed to apply when harvesting their fields. We have also seen how the attributes associated with the harvest apply to those who are being harvested by God, who is the owner of a number of fields, and how the corners of these fields have to be left to the poor when harvested and cannot be harvested by the owner. The harvest methodology also explains to us the work of the restrainer and the differences between those that are harvested by the owner of the field and those that are represented by the corners of the field. I've had a number of people asking me about Jesus' statement of not knowing the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man telling us in the Gospels that only the Father knew the day and the hour of this event, and how this fits in with the sign of Revelation 12 being fulfilled on September 23, 2017. I think this is a very valid question, as it would once again seem to cause somewhat of a contradiction in the Word of God, telling us in one place that nobody except our Heavenly Father has knowledge of this information, while saying in another place that this day will not catch certain people unawares. I've also seen that this topic is being addressed by a number of people in videos that have been posted on YouTube. So I've decided to do a video on this to show you how applying Isaiah 28 verse 10 once again will assist us to easily solve this puzzle by giving us a clear understanding of God's message to us from a biblical perspective. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. This is such a key passage in the Word of God to unlock the mysteries of this amazing book specifically when we understand how our Heavenly Father constructed His Word and intended us to study all of what is written therein in order to obtain a complete understanding. So before continuing with our study, in which we have been looking at how various aspects of the resurrection and ascension of believers are modeled after patterns found in the Bible, let us pause for a while and consider what Jesus said in the following passage concerning the day and the hour of His second coming. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. In the following passage from Mark, Jesus specifically excludes himself from having this knowledge. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. A passage from Paul that would seem to oppose in some sense what Jesus said is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. 
For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Jesus specifically excluded himself and said that nobody, not even the Son of God, knew the day or the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man, and that it is only the Father that had this knowledge. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica, describing to them the arrival of this day that will come unexpectedly to those who are in darkness, but that it will not be a surprise to people who are not in darkness. So how should we approach these two statements in order to find an understanding that does not lead to any contradiction between these passages, but instead shows us that what Jesus and Paul said actually complement each other? If you have seen the other videos posted in this channel, you would probably know by now that I love to dig into situations where we seem to be encountering contradictions in the Word of God. If we read each of these passages on their own and without considering the timing of these statements and where they are positioned on the timeline of God's Word being written, it is clear to see how two groups can form, each holding to their passage of choice and forming a doctrine around it. So often I hear people's views on the second coming of our Lord, seeing it almost as a sin to attach a date to the second coming. They would say that nobody knows the day or the hour and whatever date we set will always be wrong. I agree with this view to some degree, but when we keep Isaiah 28 verse 10 in mind, which explains to us how the supernatural book was designed and constructed, we know that each of these passages provide us with a little piece to a puzzle that we have to consider when meshed together, possibly requiring even a few more pieces that would allow us to remove the apparent contradiction and to arrive at a complete understanding of what is being conveyed to us by our Heavenly Father. So how do we go about to solve this and is it really true that we cannot know the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man? There are several aspects to consider regarding the statements by both Jesus and Paul, but once we study these with Isaiah 28 verse 10 in mind, it becomes very evident, in my opinion, what it is that our Heavenly Father is conveying to us. When we focus on Jesus' words in the book of Mark, in which Jesus said that only the Father knew the day and the hour of the second coming, instead of just considering what Jesus said here, we should also ask the following questions. Firstly, how is it possible that Jesus, who is shown to be God in the Word of God, and the equal of our Heavenly Father, could not know certain information involving himself. Secondly, had all of God's word been revealed to the world at the time when Jesus made this statement, and how does this aspect affect our understanding? Thirdly, considering Isaiah 28 verse 10, what information is Jesus conveying here to both Israel and to the church that could provide us with more insight when we combine this with other relevant passages? In addition to these three questions, it is also important to consider the chronology of the statements made in the passages that we started off with, and the events that occurred from the time that Jesus made this statement, all the way to the point where John was told to write the final chapter of the book of Revelation. This, in my opinion, plays a very important role in obtaining an understanding of our Heavenly Father's message to us and provides us with the first key to unlock this mystery. So let us look at the first point. If you are a Christian, a question that comes to mind when reading Jesus' statement about only the Father knowing the day and the hour of the second coming, and that Jesus specifically excluded himself from having this knowledge, is this. What is Jesus telling us about himself when he said this? Not only do the words of Jesus seem to contradict what Paul said, but if God is omniscient and nothing is hidden to him, how is it possible for Jesus to be truthful in stating that he did not know when the second coming would be, 
when the Bible shows us clearly that He is God in the flesh. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Is it possible that God, who is omniscient, could not know certain things, or did Jesus lie when he said that the Son did not know the timing of the events that he was referring to? This is once again something that would seem to cause a serious contradiction from a Christian perspective, but once we obtain a complete understanding of this by applying God's word to this problem, we will see that Jesus is both God and was completely truthful in his statement to his disciples when he said that only the Father knew the day and the hour of the second coming. Let us consider some passages that show us that Jesus is indeed portrayed as God in the Bible. We see Jesus being described as God in the flesh in the following passages. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill Him, because He not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was His Father, making Himself equal with God. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Considering the information conveyed in these passages, I believe it is clear to see that Jesus was indeed God, as he did have the power to take up his own life after his death on the cross, and he specifically claimed to have this power over death before his crucifixion. Not only was he resurrected, but also the Old Testament saints with him as the first fruits of the harvest, that are described as being holy unto the Father. If Jesus told a lie when he said that only the Father knew the day and the hour of the second coming, breaking the law of God in so doing, or if Jesus was not God, he would have remained in the grave as any other human on earth. Only God has the power over life and death and would be in a position to take up his own life after laying it down, and given the fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, we know that he is both God, being able to take his life up again after laying it down willingly, and being the only person able to keep the law of God perfectly. The fact that Jesus was resurrected, and that he was holy to the Father when appearing before him as the first of the first fruits of the harvest, shows us that he did indeed keep the law perfectly, and that what he told his disciples when saying that only the Father knew the day and the hour, was in fact absolutely true, as we can see stated in the following passages, confirming the fact that he kept the law perfectly. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was truly God, and we know, based on his resurrection from the dead with the Old Testament saints, 
that he did not lie when he said that only the Father knew the timing of his second coming. How was it then possible for Jesus, who is also God, to be in a position not to know the day and the hour of his second coming at the time when he spoke these words? To understand this, we need to consider information provided to us in Paul's epistles to the churches of Corinth and Romans. When we do, we also understand how it is possible for Jesus, who is 100% God, not to know specific information while he was in the flesh and before his resurrection. Jesus was born into a mortal body, and although he had the Spirit of God indwelling him right from his conception, he was subject to the same limitations that we face as human beings, living in mortal bodies. There are actually a number of passages in the Word of God showing us that it is possible for God to be limited, and I believe this specifically refers to Jesus' situation from His birth to His resurrection, and pointing out the fact that He willingly took on the form of a servant in order to rescue us from our sins and to restore our position before our Heavenly Father. This is explained to us in Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. The reason why God had to limit himself is understood when we read Psalm 78. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness, and grieve him in the desert? Yet they turned back and tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. Our sinfulness and inability to keep the law of God was the reason that God was limited, requiring Him to take on the form of a servant in order to save us from our sins. More evidence is found showing us that even though Jesus was God, He was limited in His abilities while existing in a mortal body. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor but in his own country and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages, teaching. When we are born again, God's Spirit becomes one with our spirit, and we become new creations, as can be seen in the two passages from Paul's letters to the Corinthians. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. However, when we are born again, we do not immediately receive all of God's spiritual wisdom at the point of spiritual rebirth, as this is a process that requires certain actions on our side, which are explained to us in Romans 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We can only be transformed into obtaining an understanding of spiritual matters and the wisdom of God through the renewing of our minds, and this is done by allowing God's Holy Spirit to transform us into that which God intended us to become, and that which is acceptable and pleasing to God. This process starts out with infancy and requires spiritual growth, consuming food that is age-appropriate. As we grow in the Spirit, we are also able to handle stronger meats that replace the milk with which a newborn starts out. As we grow in the Spirit, we are able to discern spiritual matters more accurately. When we submit our wills and thoughts to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to transform us into vessels that are equipped with and able to use the gifts that are imparted to those who are indwelt by Him, we begin to manifest God's spiritual wisdom through our intellects, 
even though this will never be completed or perfected while we exist in our mortal and corruptible bodies. I believe exactly the same was true for Jesus before his resurrection from the dead. He was completely spirit-filled from conception but was living in a mortal body, just as ours. He was subject to every limitation that we experience while we are alive, but in contrast to our sinful nature, he was able to keep God's law perfectly. He experienced hunger and thirst, he got tired and had to sleep. He was tempted in every aspect of life just as we are, but overcame every temptation through obedience to the Father. The Bible actually confirms the fact that Jesus also had to allow the Spirit to reveal more of God's wisdom to him and that he was not omniscient before his resurrection in a glorified body, as we can see in the following passage. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The fact that the Word of God tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom tells us that he did indeed not know everything while existing in his mortal body. The only difference between those who have been born again, having received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus before his crucifixion, is that he lived a perfectly sinless life and could, therefore, redeem us from the penalty of sin. The Apostle John confirms to us that once we are born again and have become the temple of God, having the Holy Spirit indwelling our beings and having become one with the Spirit of God, we are transformed to become similar to Jesus. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. We do not see all of this perfected in our lives yet, because of the hindrance that our sinful nature presents, which is part of our sinful physical bodies, but spiritually, we have already been completely perfected. When Jesus then said that only the Father knew the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man, he was absolutely truthful in his statement. If he told a lie in this instance, our salvation would be in jeopardy and his death on the cross would have been in vain. However, the situation completely changed after Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he received a spiritual body, and at this point he was no longer restricted by the limitations of the mortal bodies that we exist in. When we realize this, our focus changes from asking why Jesus did not know the day and the hour of his second coming, to why the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Gospels to include and highlight this piece of information in the text as we know that Jesus said that everything written in the Word of God is about Him, and that it is written to teach us something. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. Keeping these two passages in mind then, we understand that when Jesus said that he did not know the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man, this information forms part of the design of God's word, telling us something about Jesus that was given to us in order to teach us something. What would Jesus' words in this respect teach us? That nobody except the Father knows the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man? Or is there more to discover here? I think there is. Let us move on to the second point. Knowing now how Jesus was limited by his physical body before his resurrection, and that this is the reason why he did not know the timing of his second coming when mentioning this to his disciples, the next thing we have to do is to examine this in relation to how Jesus' statement is positioned within the word of God that we have before us today. Remember that at the time when Jesus said that only the Father knew the day and the hour of his second coming, God's word at this point in time only included the Old Testament. The New Testament had not been written yet, and we know that both Paul and John 
explain several mysteries in the books that they wrote subsequent to Jesus' statement about the day and the hour of his second coming. Information that was only revealed to those who would believe in Jesus after his ascension to heaven. We have to keep in mind that information about Jesus in the Word of God is progressively revealed as we start at Genesis and end with the book of Revelation. As more books were added to the Bible over a period of about 1,700 years, more information was revealed to people living in the times during which additional books were added to the Bible. To put this into perspective, Moses started this process by writing the first five books of the Old Testament, which were given to him by God in person. Once these were completed, the nation of Israel, at this point in time, did not yet have the Psalms or the Prophets or any of the books contained in the New Testament, and as such did not have any knowledge at this point in time of the information or the prophecies that would only follow later once the prophetic and New Testament books were written. The same is true in Jesus' case. Before Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, none of the mysteries contained in the New Testament had been revealed or penned, and only the Old Testament books existed. If I can give an analogy, the situation is similar to someone living in the 1600s making a statement to a friend, saying that the quickest way to travel is by horse. Viewing the statement from his position in time, he would be absolutely correct as technology did not exist yet that would allow faster modes of transport. However, we know today that such a statement, even though it would be considered true for someone who lived in the 1600s, would not be valid or true when viewed from our position in time. We know that things have dramatically changed since the 1600s and horses are certainly no longer the quickest way to get around. We have to apply the same logic to Jesus' statement about the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man. So often do I hear people say that only the Father knows the day and the hour of the second coming. And why would the Father reveal this information to us if He kept this from His Son? What makes us so special, and how can we be so arrogant to think that we could know more than Jesus, who is the Son of God? This just shows me that those who take this stance do not understand or consider the fact that the Bible reveals information progressively as you move from Genesis to the book of Revelation, and that the New Testament and the information contained therein did not exist at the point when Jesus made the statement. There was more information that followed Jesus' statement, and we have to study this to find out what it reveals to us about Jesus and His second coming. We are in a very fortunate position to evaluate the entire New Testament in connection to what Jesus said, and to apply in conjunction with it Isaiah 28 verse 10 to understand Jesus' statement. This brings us to our next point. You will by now know that when we approach Jesus' statement about the day and the hour using Isaiah 28 verse 10, we understand that Jesus' words in the book of Mark only provide us with one piece of a puzzle needed to complete the picture. Most importantly, in Jesus' statement to his disciples, he identified and highlighted very specific information for us to take note of when saying that he did not have knowledge of the day and the hour of his second coming. The next question to ask then is this. If Jesus, before his crucifixion, gave us specifics about information that was hidden from him at that time, does the Bible provide us with any indication in the New Testament that this information was, in fact, revealed to Jesus sometime after his resurrection? I believe we find just such a statement when we go to the very first verse in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 tells us that our Heavenly Father revealed specific information to Jesus which He was given to share with His servants. Let us see what the introduction of the book of Revelation tells us about this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him to show unto His servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, 
and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. What information is it that Jesus received from his Father that he did not know before this was revealed to him? What information was it that both Daniel and Paul were instructed not to reveal as the time of the end had not yet arrived? How can we, who are living in the time of the end, discover what this information is that were meant for us? Applying Isaiah 28 verse 10 while examining this, we know that the Word of God has given us a clear pointer to what information Jesus would require the Father to reveal to Him, and this specifically involves the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man, which only the Father had knowledge of. Revelation 1 verse 1 to 3 refers to this as the time that is at hand. If we approach this logically and ask ourselves what information according to God's word would need to be conveyed to the Son by the Father, where the Son did not have prior knowledge of this information, we understand from Jesus' explanation to his disciples that this information involves the day and the hour of his second coming. This is the only information that Jesus said only the Father had knowledge of, and this is the only information that Jesus identified of which he lacked knowledge before his resurrection. Jesus specifically identified this information for us under the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that we would know exactly what it is that Revelation 1 was referring to when telling us about information that was revealed to Jesus by the Father and referring to this as the time that is at hand. This passage continues to tell us that this information was converted into a sign that was given to John to share with those who are the servants of Jesus. And we understand now how Genesis 1 verse 14 explains to us God's methodology of using signs to mark specific events. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. If we had any doubts on whether this information had to do with the timing of the second coming of the Son of Man, verse 3 confirms this for us in stating that the information that was converted into a sign has to do with the time that is at hand. When we consider how Daniel was told by Gabriel to seal up specific information, we see the opposite instruction given to John, which is also linked to the introduction of the book of Revelation. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. This clearly shows us that when John finished the book of Revelation, that God's intent was to reveal this information to those who are the servants of Jesus. The only aspect missing after this point was the understanding of how the Revelation 12 sign fulfills our Heavenly Father's purpose in revealing this information to us, and that it accurately marks the next feast day of our Lord which is due for fulfillment. What is interesting to note is how the sign is applied in exactly the same manner as the sign that was utilized during the fulfillment of the first season of feasts when Jesus was crucified. God said in Genesis 1 verse 14 that he created the sun, moon and stars to act as signals to mark his appointed times. And we understand now how these are used in conjunction with the feasts of the Lord that are described to us in Leviticus 23. We have also been given a clear example of the signaling action to understand how these signals are applied to mark God's appointed times. This becomes very evident when we study their application during Jesus' crucifixion on the day of Passover, providing us with a template to apply to the next season of feasts. The day of Passover on which Jesus was crucified was the first feast of the spring season of feasts. Our Heavenly Father marked the completion of the first feast day of the spring season with a very unusual celestial sign in the form of a three hour long solar eclipse. When we read through the book of Revelation, we discover then that Revelation 12 conveys to us yet another very unusual celestial sign, a detailed heavenly alignment that is called a great wonder in heaven, emphasizing the importance of the sign and linking it to Genesis 1 verse 14, 
in which God tells us that he uses the heavens to act as his timepiece. Let us see how these two passages are linked. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, travailing and birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Linking this description to the introduction given in Revelation 1, we begin to understand the connection of Revelation 12 via Revelation 1 to Jesus' statement about not knowing the day and the hour in the Gospels. Was the sign of Revelation 12 in any way known to Jesus or the disciples when Jesus stated that he did not know the day and the hour? No. Revelation 1 tells us that the Father revealed this information to Jesus after his resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, and the book of Revelation was only written a number of decades after Jesus ascended to heaven. Does the Revelation 12 sign follow a recognizable pattern similar to that used during Jesus' crucifixion? The answer is yes, and with amazing repeatability and accuracy that I will show you as we continue. Does the sign of Revelation 12 provide us with information to know the day and the hour of the second coming of the Son of Man? Absolutely. And what is so amazing about this is that our Heavenly Father has hidden this information in His Word so that we, who would be alive at the time of the second coming of His Son, would be the only people throughout all of Earth's history to discover the day and the hour of this amazing event that will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah. How did He do this? It has to do with the way in which God structured His Word. Given that the book of Revelation is generally understood in a chronological sense, instead of applying Isaiah 28 verse 10, people did not know that the Revelation 12 sign, which is positioned in the middle of this prophetic book, actually marks the start of the events that are prophesied in this book. Previous generations also did not have knowledge of the fact that God utilizes the universe around us to mark his appointed times, just as we would set an alarm on a watch that we wear on our wrists. Only when there remained less than three and a half years to the Revelation 12 signs fulfillment could we discover that the sign does not happen halfway through the tribulation, but that it actually signals the start of this period. Coming back to Gabriel's instruction to Daniel, Daniel was told that specific prophecies and visions would remain sealed up until the time of the end. We see this written in the following passage. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Keeping Gabriel's words to Daniel in mind, we see a similar situation involving Paul and described in Paul's letter to the church of Corinth. Paul describes an event that occurred on his way to Damascus in which he met Jesus and discovered that he found himself on the wrong side of the fence. In this encounter, Paul met Jesus and was given abundant revelations that he was not allowed to talk about. We read about this in 2 Corinthians 12. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. 
but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul states that it was not lawful for a man to utter or speak the words that he heard. Just as in Daniel's situation, Paul would have been subject to the same application of Gabriel's explanation to Daniel, as Paul also did not live in the end times. What was our Heavenly Father's purpose in sealing up these words until the time of the end? I believe that in our Father's love for us, it was not His will to reveal all aspects of the end times to those who would be living in the years preceding this time. I am of the opinion that there was a loving purpose for having done this. If people living in centuries leading up to our time knew that the coming of the Son of Man would not happen in their lifetimes, it would completely remove the hope that God intended for those that were watching and preparing for His coming from the days that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost up to the point where the timing of this sign's fulfillment was discovered. Paul describes this hope to us in the following passage, hope that he clearly also had. Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. This verse would lose all relevance if people knew that they would die before these events could occur, and this is why I believe our God has hidden this information from previous generations, until now. This secret is now revealed to us who are alive and living in the time of the end that Daniel was told would one day come. This time starts when our Heavenly Father reaps the main harvest of His field, representing those who had faith in Jesus as the Son of God, who took away the sins of the world and accepting His free gift of salvation. Those who are alive at this point, when this event occurs, looking forward with excitement to their unification unto their Lord and Savior, will be in a very fortunate position in that they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from existing as mortal beings to becoming immortal in an instant, having the opportunity to prepare and ready themselves to become part of a very special group of people that will not have to experience death. If you've seen the first two videos that were uploaded in this channel, you will know that the prophecy and the vision that Daniel was told would be sealed up until the end is linked to the very first prophecy that was given by God himself in Genesis 3, and the vision given to John and revealed to us in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. Both of these events are marked by similar heavenly signs matching the description of Revelation 12. These heavenly signs are also the only two of their kind found throughout the history of the earth. I have linked images to these two alignments in the description below if you are interested in viewing them and their associated dates. These signs are very unique given the combination of heavenly events occurring simultaneously and carry immense importance. The sign of Revelation 12 has nothing to do with any person trying to predict a future event. It is, in fact, an alarm setting that our Heavenly Father has set on His timepiece as explained to us in Genesis 1 verse 14, which was given to Jesus after His ascension to heaven, to share with those who are His servants and who are watching for His return as their Savior. It was explained to us in detail so that we could use the technology available to us today to know exactly when this will occur. Just as we are able to read the time on a watch and know where the hands would point when it is 9.23 a.m and 17 seconds, we can know the day and the hour of the return of the Son of Man by understanding the sign of Revelation 12. Similar to having hands for hours, minutes and seconds on a normal watch over a dial, we have correlating items in the heavens in the form of the sun, planets and the moon over the backdrop of constellations. In the case of Revelation 12, the moon, similar to the hand indicating seconds on a watch, points out the shortest increment of time on God's timepiece mentioned in the vision given to John, and in this case, the hour during which this alignment will be achieved. This begins, in my opinion, 
as soon as the moon moves from being perfectly aligned with the feet of the woman in the Virgo constellation to being under her feet. Before we look at the significance of where the fulfillment of this sign is positioned, allow me to quickly address the claims by some that this sign occurs a day after the Feast of Trumpets. When we look at the moon phase calendar for September this year, you will see that the new moon occurs on the 20th. We have to keep in mind that a day on God's calendar starts at sundown on one day and ends at sundown the next day. So if we view this lunar phase calendar, we see that new moon day is on the 20th. And the evening of the 20th does not provide an opportunity for spotting the first sliver of the moon. New moon day starts then at sundown on the 20th and ends at sundown on the 21st. The first day of Rosh Hashanah starts at sundown of the 21st and ends at sundown of the 22nd. The second day starts at sundown of the 22nd and ends at sundown of the 23rd. When we consider the pattern that we were provided in the methodology with which God marked the completion of the first feast day of the spring season, we discover then that the pattern with which the Revelation 12 sign marks the completion of the first feast of the second season is a perfect match. Let me show you what I mean. Viewed from Israel's perspective and from Jerusalem, the nation around which all of this revolve and to which the sign would have applied if they did not reject their Messiah, let us see what our Heavenly Father is showing us through the sign. We see that the moon is absent from the alignment during the first half of September and that it only moves into proximity of the woman from the 19th of this month. We focus our attention then on the feet of the woman as we see the following written about the alignment in Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. When you consider how a watch functions, we see that the hand indicating seconds moves the fastest, and this is how the moon behaves in this alignment. We know then that the sign as described in Revelation 12 is fulfilled, once the moon moves past the point where it is perfectly aligned with the feet of the woman. When we look at this in Stellarium, we see that the hour that follows this point in time starts roughly around 1845 on September 23rd local time in Israel and would then continue until roughly 1945 to reach the completion of this hour. The physical time that is associated with this sign's fulfillment is also very important given the position in the day during which this sign is accomplished. If we now look at timeanddate.com and we look at the time during which the 23rd of September ends and the 24th of September starts using God's definition of a day, we see the following. Sunlight begins to fade at 1834 and reaches complete darkness at 1955. The period that is marked out by the Revelation 12 sign sits right in the center of this period, with a few minutes of almost equal length on each side to spare. The precision with which the Revelation 12 sign then marks the hour of transition between September 23rd and September 24th is perfectly aligned with how God would determine the period in which one day would transition into the next. What can we deduct from what we see here? When we understand the significance of the timing of this sign, we can clearly see how our Heavenly Father is marking the transition of one day to the next day. But this is not where it ends. This sign also marks the transition of one week to the next and of one month into the next. It also indicates the end of one year on the Jewish calendar, or 5777, and the beginning of the next, or 5778. This also marks, in my opinion, the end of a dispensation, and in this case, the end of the church age, and the beginning of the tribulation. It marks the point at which the main harvest occurs, and the point at which the corners of God's field remain, being left to the poor. This sign also marks the completion of the Feast of Trumpets, utilizing the same methodology 
and pattern that our Heavenly Father used during the Spring Feast and Jesus' last year on earth to mark the onset of that feast season. This also happens to be the very next feast scheduled for Jesus to fulfill and aligns perfectly with the timing indicated by the Revelation 12 sign. If this sign fell on the 22nd of September it would not mark the completion of the Feast of Trumpets and would therefore have deviated from the pattern that God used during the Spring Feast. I don't know about you but I find this accuracy and repeatability absolutely astonishing. Given the gravity of these many incredible facets that are all perfectly aligning with several important aspects mentioned in the Word of God, I struggle to understand why every Christian is not jumping up and down in realization of what this means. We have several incredibly unique aspects all converging on a very specific hour of a very specific and very important day on God's calendar. This is also the feast which is known as the day and the hour that nobody knows, and the day on which the last trumpet or the awakening blast is sounded. What I find even more astonishing and disturbing is that there are well-known Christians and prophecy teachers like John Hagee and Joel Richardson who are trying to debunk this sign. Joel has gone as far as betting a hundred thousand dollars against the Revelation 12 sign marking the fulfillment of God's next appointed time and trying to refute the significance of the sign. I'm not sure why someone would try to prove the word of God wrong as you are setting yourself up for assured failure and it is clear that both of these teachers have not spent any time trying to understand the properties of the Revelation 12 sign. It would also seem that Joel is evaluating people based on their credentials in theology instead of relying on the Holy Spirit to discern whether the information he is trying to debunk comes from God. Telling people to pay no attention to the sign of Revelation 12 is in fact telling people not to watch for the return of the Lord as stated by Jesus in Luke. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. How blind can one be and why would one choose to directly oppose Jesus' instructions as given to us in Luke in connection with being prepared for his second coming? Not only is this flagrant disobedience to the instructions of our Savior, but it is leading many people astray and putting them in danger of being left behind and being found unprepared when the Lord returns. Even if this information was not clearly shown to us in the Word of God, a prophecy teacher's attitude should always remain watchful and expecting our Lord to return at any time. If you are a prophecy teacher and you don't understand what God's word is telling us with respect to the Revelation 12 sign, search the scriptures daily and continue to search until you find the answers and while you are searching for the truth, encourage your followers to remain watchful. If you tell your followers to ignore what the word of God says about the time that is at hand because you don't know, telling them to close their eyes and sleep for a while, you are not only causing yourself to be classified as an unwise virgin, but you are leading thousands of people astray with you. I pray that the Lord will in His grace and mercy towards us allow people's eyes to be open to the truth in the short time that remains before this hour arrives. When I listen to people's views about the rapture, I am again astonished and saddened to see the number of people that view this day in a negative sense. I guess the negativity came about as a result of so many people in the past having very pure intentions in many situations, being wrong about dates that they have set, instead of allowing the Word of God to reveal our Heavenly Father's marked feast day due for fulfillment as understood from His Word. Many dismiss or even lash out at others when the word rapture is mentioned, instead of focusing on Jesus' words instructing us to watch for His return. Why then the aggression when God's word clearly shows us his plan for September 23rd, 2017? When an expectation is set and it passes as a non-event, it naturally leads to disappointment. But does that mean that we should altogether ignore the subject and any future applications? I've been disappointed before, especially in 2014 and 2015 when we had the Blood Moon Tetrads coinciding exactly with four feast days 
and in this case it also included two solar eclipses that fell on the Lord's feast days. This added up to a total of six feast days that were marked by heavenly signs, something that has not happened in the past 2000 years. I was aware of the Revelation 12 sign at this point but was also focusing on the possibility that one of the feast days during this period may have marked the day on which the Lord would return for us. I knew at this point that these heavenly markers were part of God's timepiece, but at that time the Revelation 12 sign was still a few years out and was not understood as well as we understand it today. When nothing happened in 2015 I was disappointed, but my attention immediately shifted to understand more about the Revelation 12 sign, which will be fulfilled on September 23rd of this year. I also believe that the blood moons were specifically given to make us aware of the fact that our Heavenly Father uses the universe around us to mark specific appointed times as can be seen in the book of Joel. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Before the blood moons were discovered, nobody was even aware of the fact that our Heavenly Father marked His appointed times with celestial signs. This knowledge was hidden to the world just a decade or so ago. This discovery, however, led to the investigation of the Revelation 12 sign after nothing happened in 2015 and as you probably know by now, if you have seen the first two videos that I have posted in August and September of 2016, that there are several amazing aspects also involving Jupiter all converging in September of this year. So what are we to do with this day and hour that are clearly marked by God in His Word and in the heavens? I have seen that there are three groups of people that we can identify when considering the date of September 23, 2017. The first are those who have been born again and who are fully aware of what this date represents and who are preparing to meet the Lord with great expectation, ignoring all disappointments of the past and not caring whether they could possibly face another disappointment come September 24th. They look forward to this day with great anticipation and their thoughts are focused daily on that which is fast approaching. They have little to no desire for what this world has to offer and focus on that which can only be perceived in the Spirit. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Secondly, there are those who are either completely ignorant of this day, they just do not care about God's signals that he provides to the world, or they are actively opposing others who look forward to this day. It would seem that these people either do not have the Spirit of God indwelling them, or do not have an intimate relationship with their Heavenly Father, and love this world more than they love their God. They focus on their lives here on earth and are well connected to the world, and enjoy what the world has to offer, with little desire to experience what God has in store for those that love Him. I believe this will be the group who will not only experience immense disappointment, but also terror and horror when they realize on this day that they missed a golden opportunity to be part of God's main harvest. While September 23rd is a yet future date, you still have the opportunity to change the group that you belong to. If you change your attitude from being offended at the mention of the rapture, to looking forward to this day and praying continuously as instructed by Jesus, I believe you will be part of the group that will be changed in an instant and meeting the Lord in the air. If not, then prepare to face a very difficult decision that will determine your eternal position before God. I always think of these people's attitudes compared to a bride that decides to sleep in on her wedding day. If you were in the bridegroom's position, how would you react to this kind of attitude? with the following words of Jesus not fit the situation. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. What I have found most amazing is the third group of people. These are people who serve Satan in his kingdom on earth, and they have been well aware of this date for much longer than the Christians 
who only discovered this information in the past few years. Satan, who is in control of the media, has been flaunting this date very noticeably before the world through those that serve him in various movies and television series, if one pays careful attention. He knows exactly when his short time on earth will start and have also come to understand what it was that the Father revealed to the Son after his resurrection and ascension. This is the date on which Satan will receive ultimate authority over the earth and over those that will remain on the earth after this date. From this date until the return of the Lord three and a half years later, he will be able to do as he pleases, unhindered by those who had the fullness of God's Spirit which restrained him for the past 2000 years. He has had almost 20 centuries to study the completed word of God and to understand the sign given in Revelation 12. And if even the enemy was able to figure this date out and flaunting it unbeknownst to the masses through the media for decades, what does that say about those who have no clue about this? Please have a look at this phenomenon on YouTube. There are many videos out there in which people track the occurrences of reference to September 23rd or 923, which is a date and a number that is far more prominent than any other date or number used or referenced in any of the entertainment media. To summarize then, when we understand that our Heavenly Father designed His Word to be understood by applying Isaiah 28 verse 10, requiring us to combine various pieces of information found in this incredible book, we understand that when Jesus said that only the Father knew the day and the hour, that this was recorded to assist us in identifying what exactly the Father would reveal to Jesus in the introduction of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 tells us that the information that the Father gave to the Son has to do with the time that is at hand, and combining this with what Jesus told us, it involves the day and the hour of His second coming. We also know that God's next appointed time, that is at hand, and due for fulfillment, is the Feast of Trumpets. In addition to this, God's Word tells us that He created the universe around us to mark His appointed times, as can be read in Genesis 1 verse 14. And these seven appointed times are given to us in Leviticus 23. When John wrote down the introduction of Revelation, he was told that the information that Jesus received from the Father, having to do with the next appointed time, was converted into a sign, and that this would be shared with the servants of Jesus. What an incredible discovery to find then that Revelation 12 contains the description of a very unique heavenly sign that has only occurred twice in history, marking the prophecy and the vision that Daniel was told would be sealed until the time of the end. So now that you too have knowledge of this information and are shown how God is clearly informing us of when his next feast will be fulfilled, will you choose to follow other people's opinions on this matter or will you choose to follow what the word of God has to say? Remember that our enemy in this world has long ago figured this information out and he awaits the removal of the restrainer to step onto the scene and to have complete authority over those that were found asleep at the time when this event occurs. Will you choose to pay no attention whatsoever to this opportunity that our Heavenly Father extends to every person on earth to meet Him in the clouds on September 23rd? Or will you accept His invitation and expect His return on this day, even if the possibility exists that these incredible signs have been wrongly interpreted? What do you have to lose by ensuring that you are ready? My view of the Revelation 12 sign is that if I place my hope in meeting our Savior on this day and hour, knowing that this date signals our departure from earth as part of God's main harvest and nothing happens, then life goes on as we know it. I have nothing to lose by ensuring that I am ready and watching for the return of Jesus to remove us from the earth. If nothing happens, then the restrainer remains in place and we live under God's grace and we continue to overcome Satan by putting on the full armor of God. I will surely be disappointed should nothing happen 
and if this is indeed the case I would have no idea where to begin to look for answers as everything including several patterns that we have discussed clearly highlights this day with great accuracy from various angles and I can find no evidence of any other heavenly sign given to us in the Word of God that is so clearly shouting at us from within the Word of God as that of Revelation 12. With the fear of people's ridicule or the possibility of being disappointed prevent me from watching for our escape from the earth on this day? Absolutely not. I will happily face disappointment and ridicule knowing that I would be found doing what our Lord instructed us to do and doing my best to encourage others to also watch for the return of the Lord as instructed in God's word, knowing full well that we are flawed and could get it wrong once again. What is my motive for doing this? Am I after fame and fortune and recognition here on earth? Absolutely not. I love our Heavenly Father above all, and His compassion for His people on earth is what I believe is the driving force behind me creating these videos and sharing with you what our Heavenly Father has revealed to me. Our Father has allowed me amazing insight and understanding of His Word which is something I give Him all the glory for and I pray that He will also allow me to do a job worthy of His calling. If I had the financial means I would do this full time but I can only spend my free time on creating these videos and this takes time. Having received this understanding then, how can I then expect to please Him if I keep all of this insight and understanding to myself? I cannot do anything but to share it with those who would be willing to listen and study this for themselves to see if what I say is in fact true. Please do not blindly believe what I tell you as I am flawed and often get things wrong as well. But study the Word of God for yourself to see whether what I am saying is true and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to you. That is why I ask that you please consider this information and pay close attention to what God's Word tells us about the time before us. The second option you have is to choose to do as most people out there do and in most cases teach their followers to do as well. You can continue your life ignoring this important information and deal with whatever you face when September 24th arrives. If September 23 is indeed the day on which our God fulfills His feast day, would you be prepared to be left behind and to face the three and a half years that will follow on the earth where Satan and his angels will have supreme authority over those that remain and will kill every Gentile on earth through beheading who refuses to accept the mark of the beast? It is your choice and our Heavenly Father has given each of us a free will to choose as we will. The Bible tells us that those who want to receive everlasting life after the main harvest has occurred will have to be put to death through beheading after refusing the mark of the beast in order to obtain it. My heart's desire is that you will be part of the only group in the history of the earth that would not have to experience death but instead be translated from an existence in a mortal body to an abundant everlasting life as part of God's family in a glorified spiritual body, being changed from one form to the next in the twinkling of an eye. My wish for you is that you will experience the incredible joy that I have in knowing that our redemption is drawing close, and that our time on the earth is fast coming to an end, and that what will follow for those who form part of the main harvest will be beyond our ability to comprehend or describe. Please consider focusing your attention on the things that are above and not on the things that this world has to offer. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope this information will bless you and assist you to receive better understanding of the Word of God and that it will give you new insight into passages that are often difficult to understand. I hope to see everyone that watches this video in the clouds on September the 23rd when we will meet our Savior and each other in the air and in person. Until next time, God bless.